Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to the Wayward Festival and virtually to Aberdeen. We are brought to you today by the Word Centre for Creative Writing with the generous support of Creative Scotland and the University of Aberdeen and also in collaboration with the Explorathon Festival. I'm delighted to be able to have Alice Tarbuck and Jessica J. Lee here with us today for this nature writing event. My name is Hannah and I'm an English student and I'm a member of this year's Wayward Festival Committee. I'm going to be chairing this discussion today. We're also very happy to have the wonderful Leslie Crerar here today to provide BSL interpretation and she should be visible to you throughout this event. We also have Louise Pepper providing live captioning and if you need captions you can access these by clicking on the CC button on your Zoom toolbar. Thank you so much to you all for coming. I'm going to introduce Alice and Jessica and then they're going to read from their latest books, both of which are definitely two of the most beautiful books I've owned. Um, briefly show you them, but you'll be hearing from them. Um, and then there'll be time for an audience Q&A towards the end. So if you have anything you'd like to ask, pop it in the Q&A box and we'll pick it up then. So a big welcome to Jessica. Jessica is a British, Canadian, Taiwanese uh, author and environmental historian living in, Lund in Cambridge. She's the author of two books of nature writing, Turning, published in 2017, and Two Trees Make a Forest, published in 2019. She has a PhD in environmental history and aesthetics and was writer in residence at the Leibniz Institute for Freshwater Ecology in Berlin from 2017 to 2018. Jessica is also the founding editor of the Willow Herb Review and a researcher at Cambridge University. I'd also like to welcome Alice Tarbuck. Alice is an award-winning Scottish poet and writer. She has taught creative writing at the University of Dundee and is a 2019 Scottish Book Trust's new Writers Awardee for Poetry. Her de debut <laughs> non-fiction book, A Spell in the Wild, A Year and Six Centuries of Magic, was published in 2020. So Alice, if we could hear from you first, if you could remind us uh, what you're going to read and then just take it from there. Thank you so much, Hannah, for chairing. And um, it's so lovely to be here with you and Jessica and Leslie. So I am reading from my chapter about June and about midsummer, if we can cast our minds back to then. So June appears bright and strange out of May's gentleness. And I am on a train again, stitching the miles towards the south of England, to the south downs, which roll past the window, all soft undulation and a particular deep green that signals summer's height. The train passes the long man of Wilmington, a huge chalk figure who stands imposing on the hillside from where he flings out a perpetual challenge. I fall instantly in love with him. He is standing proud on the hillside and he seems to hold in his hand two long poles. I'm not sure what they are, but when I ask a local witch whose coven worship there, she laughs. They aren't poles, of course, but the sides of a doorway. He is holding open the door between the worlds, this ancient figure, and inviting us to come through. Midsummer is the time of the looking glass, of things not being quite as they appear. Commonly, we speak of Halloween as a time when the veils between our world and all other worlds is thin. Midsummer, with its excess of light, might feel less eerie, but don't be fooled. The world is made strange enough at midsummer, and it is a time of mischief, even in the long grey twilight. Midsummer is a time of the unruly, of too much light, of dancing until your body drops. The world must keep its eyes open longer than is comfortable. Fairies appear from hedgerows, Men are rendered invisible by pockets full of bracken. Witches must be burned and future husbands stride into dreams. What is missing from the revelry, it seems, is the presence of dread. Witchcraft, magic and misrule are all so often feared or accompanied by legends of being stolen away or the devil appearing. <laughs> 
Midsummer is almost entirely free of those associations. Even though the fairies are said to walk abroad, their harm is of a more benign sort. The year is full of labour and remains so, even though the vast majority of us now do not work the land in Britain. But midsummer is a day of relaxing, of seeing the world in its verdant glory, drinking and eating and dancing as long as the light holds. As a teenager, I was taken to Orkney as part of a series of trips the school ran that involved orienteering, character building and cramming teenagers into youth hostels around rural Scotland. The trip to Orkney was among the least physically demanding and so we were a strange ramshackle bunch, all weak ankles and complicated physical shortcomings. I wanted to go to Orkney, certainly, but I also didn't want to climb seven hills in ten days. We went at midsummer, accompanied by two men from the physics department, one of whom was a born-again Christian and a faith healer. Alongside the puffins and cliff tops, the strange kitchen at the youth hostel and the, the nesting skewers that the boys disturbed, the thing I best remember is the light. I had never seen light like it. It simply didn't get dark. It wasn't that it was bright light the way it was in Iceland at the solstice. Rather, it was a lightly shadowed dusk that made way very briefly for stars before the blues and pinks of dawn broke through again. It's the feeling that I remember more than anything else, an extraordinary energy. I've always lived through light. Northerly people often do, dreading the dark of winter and exulting in the longer, brighter hours of summer when so much more can be done. But before I went to Orkney, I had never considered the light to be part of my magical practice. Still young, I had mostly been undertaking highly formalised spells, stolen from Willow in Buffy and the terrifying girls in The Craft, and any other little bits of information I could glean. There was lots of velvet and complicated invocations to goddesses whose importance I didn't understand. It wasn't particularly nature-based as a practice, mostly because I had no examples to follow. But the light in Orkney changed that forever. It was as if my body had been filled with lightning or the static energy you feel before a storm. I couldn't sleep and spent 10 days in a strange daze, a potent mixture of sleep deprivation and intense socializing. I felt very alive in a way that is hard to describe and things kept happening. The things that happened were all small, seem too minor now to mention in much detail. The most important was the overwhelming urge to gather things. All children pick up rocks, bits of grass, beach combings, I think, if given the chance. But I'd stopped as a teen because it was no longer sweet. And my mum got tired of finding homes for buckets of beach gravel. I could never identify anything. And what on earth was I going to do with all those bits of rock? When I got to Orkney, the urge came back. It was as if I thought I could gather up the light in my arms, store it in these rocks like batteries and take them home with me. Rocks and shells and little strands of dried out seaweed. Now I am a much more sensible forager and know what I want, but I do have tendencies. Keep your eye out for tansy, they're in flower. I wonder if the nettles are still soft enough at the tips for a second pick. Because I am disorganised, my pockets and my handbag are always filled with seed pods, with leaves and little berries and things I'm going to dry and use until I forget them. That tendency comes partly from developing my witchcraft, from simply needing a wider range of materials, but also a great deal of it is to do with wishing to hold onto things as they currently appear. <laughs>
and I'm aware of the time, so I will close my reading there. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. That was really beautifully read. Um, so I'm just going to ask you a few questions, if that's OK. Um, you talked in this chapter about your trip to Orkney and with the desire you felt to forage and gather as a teenager and your awareness of the light and how transformative that was for you. I'm interested in how your journey into witchcraft from that initial point as a teenager um, has helped you to shape you as the person and the writer you are today. Thank you, Hannah. What a lovely question. I think that trip was pivotal in a number of ways. My family are atheists and on that trip I went to church which was something I wasn't used to doing because our teacher took us and I remember being so upset that I had to leave the beautiful beach where the sea looked so wonderful and we were all having a lovely time to go and sit in this in this church and I remember thinking I think it's much more important what's happening outside than what's happening in here um, and I think that for the beginning was the beginning for me of understanding what I believed as being separate from the kind of um, great miasma of belief that we all grow up with in a kind of notionally Christian country. And I think the other thing about it for me is that witchcraft, which began for me in childhood in some ways and has kept going, has been a lens through which I see the natural world. So although A Spell in the Wild is a book about witchcraft in some ways, it's also a nature book. It's a, it's a piece of nature writing. Um, although I think maybe people find it hard to see beyond the witchcraft. But I think it is for me very important that I see the world through a lens of what is happening in the more than human world, both in terms of animals and networks and um, the biosphere, but also in terms of the ways in which those things give and share power and relationships and how those can be used, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely, definitely does. Um, so thinking about your writing and your idea gathering process, um, whether that's physically foraging or um, researching in other ways, um, to what extent do you feel like it's an act of defiance to be reclaiming this old wisdom that's been lost, um, particularly when we think about the past treatment of women who were believed to be witches? So this is a very interesting question because it hits on one of the central myths about witches that perpetuate in our culture. So old forms of wisdom, by those we often mean folk wisdom, um, remedies that came about before formalized medicine, uh, all manner of things which we now have um, either discredited and come to reclaim or that um, have been subsumed by other means of being in the world. But I think it's important that we remember that the people accused of being witches during the medieval witch hysteria were not witches as we understand them. They were the victims of a, a sort of social genocide that stretched across Europe. And one of the troubling elements of contemporary witchcraft discourse is the idea that witches are the same as, or are kind of upholding the values of these ancient practices that these people had. Whereas of course they didn't have them. Um, and the ancient practices that we are reclaiming, we find in a whole range of different places from people who were not witches or were not understood to be witches. And it's very difficult because historically there have been many, many, many names for witch, um, all sorts of things from um, the Viking period, from early English, um, many subcategories. And now we only have the word witch. And so it's a very much a one size fits all sort of a category. And it can be difficult to see that break in historical continuity because we're using the same word in both places. But in terms of where I get my ideas from or, or how I approach my writing. Um, so I am an academic um, and I have a doctorate in contemporary poetics. So my brain is very much a research brain. I like diving down rabbit holes and I like looking in libraries for obscure things. And I very much enjoyed for this book revisiting the witchcraft texts 
that I had access to as a teenager and the ones that came kind of kind of came before me. But I also, you are completely right, understand uh, research practice to be an embodied thing. So one of the things I love about uh, Jessica's book, and we'll hear from Jessica in a minute, is uh, all of the incredible walking that happens in the book and the trips to see, um, to kind of enmesh herself in the landscape of Taiwan. And I, um, although I cannot always walk very far, um, I'm a huge fan of being outside and experiencing the world so that I can understand it in a way that is not just with my brain, but also with my body, even if that just involves lying in a garden or sitting in a park um, or, you know, making a bother of myself around the edge of uh, car parks where I see blackberries or rose hips or, you know, lots of um, jumping over fences. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you for clearing that up. Um, I'll, I think we have time for one more question. Um, each chapter of your book is named after a different month of the year. And in your reading of June, you mentioned that if witchcraft makes you more aware of the seasons and how to live on the earth as it is, then it also makes you aware of how lovely but temporal and fleeting things are. And maybe you could just touch on um, this idea a bit more and what you've gained from appreciating and celebrating every cycle of seasonal change um, yeah, in your practice of witchcraft. So witches or some witches celebrate the wheel of the year, which is eight festivals. Uh, four of those are equinoxes or solstices. Um, the rest of them are moments of cultural importance. And they synthesize lots of different cultures, pagan beliefs. So harvest festivals, we roll them all together into one. Um, the reason I love it uh, is that I grew up, as I say, in an atheist household and was always very jealous of um, people doing harvest festival and, and, you know, kind of the hymns that you would sing at Easter or, you know, I didn't feel that I had a special way of marking all of those changes that happen all the time. And the wheel of the year, if anything, is too intense. Eight festivals means that you're always like coming from one and going to the next. And, um, but I love it because what it makes you do is it makes you pay attention to the way that the world changes year on year, which can be very frightening at the moment because we're in climate catastrophe. So there is a, you know, it's not, it's not frosty when it should be, or it's not hot when it should be, or things that you would expect to be in flower are early or late. But on the other hand, it lets you feel like you are very connected to the world because you are always looking forwards to the next change and looking back to what has just gone and setting your body to that rhythm. So when it is the winter, I tend to do more um, internal work, I suppose. So therapeutic work, um, things that I believe I need to kind of let go of or overcome. And in the summer, I'm much more likely to do socializing, outside work, uh, stuff that engages with the world more. And that's a very broad example, but I think for me, it's very important because that's what the world is doing. So that's what feels like a good way of keeping my body in line with the world and not asking myself to do things where possible, that are against the rhythm of the year, which I think is something that capitalism, for example, asks us to do. It doesn't matter if it's the middle of December or the middle of June, we still have to get up at 7am and do our commuting in a non-pandemic period. And I think for me, at least being aware that the rest of the world is sleeping feels like a kind of revolutionary act. Brilliant. What a great answer. Thank you, Alice. Um, I think we're right on time for Jessica to do your reading. Yeah, absolutely, thank you Hannah, uh, thanks for having me and thank you Alice for such a lovely, lovely reading. Um, I'm gonna read a little bit from uh, near, the, near the beginning of Two Trees, um, it's from the second chapter uh, and it's a little bit about memory and place and change and transformation. Taipei was a city that belonged to my childhood imagination Built of words spoken quietly to me by my mother, its streets were paved with her longings. The air was made of memories. In this place, Taipei was a single hillside 
a school at its crest and a tenement block at its base. A packed dirt road cut a straight line between them, bustling with street food sellers in carts that looked uncannily like the Toronto hot dog vendors of my youth. There was no wind and there were no trees. The light was yellow and the only smell was that of the chou dofu my mother missed most after leaving Taiwan. But does it really smell like poo? I would ask her, having never smelled chou dofu before. Not at all. It smells delicious, she would reply, tucking me into bed. Then why is it called stinky tofu? She would shrug, smiling as if a morsel of that memory had just passed her lips. Every day as a schoolgirl, my mother would linger on the hillside buying snacks, avoiding going home after school. She loved to eat, so her face was rounder then, her body plumper, like the one black and white photograph I had seen from the time. She bought tofu and spring onion pancakes and sugar cane juice with handfuls of silver coins. By the time she would make it home, it was sundown. The apartment was green gray and dark with bars over the windows and plants everywhere. Dust motes hung suspended in the air. She snuck in quietly to avoid getting into trouble, but she wasn't quiet enough. My grandmother was angry she'd taken so long to come home. Worse, she was getting a bit fat. Paul waved the meat cleaver. There were angry words and my mother was bundled into her bedroom, the door locked. She told me about Taipei in fragments and sometimes I wonder if this is all she could remember. Taipei in 1960 was home to nearly a million people but the past she reconstructed for me was a small picture. My grandparents, herself and a walk full of deep fried tofu. An entire city reduced to a single road of street vendors. In adulthood, my time in Taiwan relieved me of this naive picture. I found a city unfolding from the flatlands on the western coast. A web of wilting concrete apartment complexes towered over by glassy high rises. Elevated highways spiraled, ensnaring the scooters that pollinated the thoroughfares with fumes. Tiled walls were caked with algae and on every old building the signs of nature's tenacity showed themselves. Ferns growing from brick thick ledges, flowers springing skywards from the joints of old awnings. Tucked into a river basin with leaf laden slopes on all sides, the city center was flat and uniform. The stark lonely hillside of my childhood imagining was nowhere to be seen. Instead, the green hills that surround the, the river basin were the dark background to my every movement. I walked Taipei's streets with my mother and alone in search of an anchor, my map a jumble of transliterations and characters pressed into the two small spaces of the lines of roads. I wanted to learn the island by its landmarks the way my mother had once done, but the open stretches of rice paddy and field that she had once known had become part of the city with broad avenues and famous skyscrapers. Once we found one of the old city gates stranded in the middle of a roundabout and my mother knew immediately where she was, despite the new road. A hundred meters beyond it, she was lost again. I found myself drawn to the island's backbone. In forests and on mountains, the urgency of time receded and the pacing minutes I'd grown accustomed to in the city stretched molten until they evaporated, small and inconsequential things in the face of arboreal and lithic time. It was on trails that I ceased to check my phone, turning my attention instead to the multitudes that arrayed themselves at my feet. The compression of ages, packed tight by many walkers, the patient growth of moss on weathered stones, and when I was very high up, beyond the tree line or on some rocky outcrop, the layered stones that tell the story of a mountain. I moved from the human timescale of my family's story through green and unfurling dendrological time, to that which far exceeds the scope of my understanding, the deep and fathomless span of geological time. Many of my days roaming these slopes were shrouded in trees, and on the occasions I, that I rose beyond them, I found myself in cloud. The tree line here is a good thousand meters higher than on the European mountains I've grown used to, up to 3,500 meters altitude, a remarkable remarkable thing when traveling the island's short span from sea level to the mountains. 
The geology of Taiwan tells a complex tale of emergence into air and compaction over time, of magmatic flows and stark coral limestone thrust from salt water. But on shattered slopes, made worse by tree clearance, mining, and monocrop plantations, I saw the damage wrought by typhoons and quakes, the slow steadiness of stone diminished to scree, the tracks of graveled mud left in the flow of landslides. Mountains could be rattled all too quickly, their timelines fractured in mere moments. Thank you, I'll stop there. Thank you for that beautiful reading, Jessica. Um, we talked with Alice about the idea of, well, I suggested the idea of reclaiming, and I'm just wondering if you feel that word is pertinent to your work, um, whether you feel it's important discussing your own past or your mother's. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, one of the core motivations behind writing this book was a sense of recl reclamation and needing to reclaim something. Um, you know, I, I, it wasn't an obvious choice to choose to do a nature writing book about Taiwan, um, which is where my mom grew up. But for me, it really came from this place of feeling like I hadn't, I had sort of given it short shrift in so much of my life and in my growing up. And so being able to devote the time and attention of this book to that place um, and to my grandparents' story felt, yeah, it felt like this act of, of sort of, I guess reclamation, but also making up for something that maybe I hadn't done. Um, there's like a, a making up for lost time kind of dynamic. And also, I guess part partly, you know, a, a bit of a feeling of penance in, in, in sort of making up for something that I wish I had done earlier in my life, you know, devoting time to learning place, learning language, learning that sort of intimacy and sort of le like the lexicon of a land that I think is really... I guess really tied to like an idea of belonging and home and my mom feels that in Taiwan and I just I hadn't spent any time there when I was growing up and um, had only really begun to spend time there as an adult and and that was really important to me to like properly attend to it if that makes sense. Yeah definitely. Um, my next question is sort of a bit specific to me and my interpretation of the book but um, I was really so struck by um, when you talked about the fact you're being an environmental historian, you, you knew all the plants, well, lots of plants in Europe. When you came to Taiwan, you were confronted with so many strange and foreign species. And I'm wondering in your writing, how do you deal with, um, you know, the difference between, how do you strike a balance between na documenting nature scientifically and documenting it more emotionally and perhaps you could touch on the difference in the way you approach uh, writing about plants that you know and that you don't know. Yeah I mean I think it's it's a delicate balance because I, I think also so much of my own training you know as, as probably most most scholars who are trained sort of in the environmental humanities now will tell you is like we're taught in so many ways not to read ourselves too much into a place and too much into into non-human nature um, but of course, you know, we're human <laughs> and then we have an entire sort of cultural history in the West, at least, of reading ourselves <laughs> into nature. Um, and it's really hard to shed that. And so I think, you know, I try to write with a sort of conscientiousness about that. Um, but I think, you know, for me, when I was confronted with plants that I didn't know or that seemed sort of out of place or foreign or, or somewhat baffling to me because they were plants that I just... I felt like I should know, but I didn't, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, and my mom would know them. And that was sort of the sort of revealing thing for me is that it would be walking along and I just sort of would be in awe of all these things I didn't know. And my mom would say, oh, that's this plant and that's this plant. And I had never seen her have that same fluency in sort of the temperate regions where I grew up in North America and in, and in Europe. And seeing her have that in Taiwan was really like, oh, right, this is the place she's from. It, it was sort of... I don't know, it was quite revealing to me and I, I feel like it, how do I put it, my approach to those plants and the way I wrote them was really like, there was no way to divorce that from my own feeling of belonging and not belonging as a mixed race person in Taiwan, feeling like this in, ostensibly is, is, is partly my home in a way, but also not, and I, I didn't really know how to negotiate it, and so I feel like I like that became like intricately linked to how I thought about the plants and how I wrote about the plants. Yeah, I, I love that 
exploration I, it's probably just a small part that I've picked up on but I, I really liked it and I liked how the illustrations of the plants as well sort of made it feel like a sketchbook like a travel sketchbook and you're sort of figuring out things about um, the country um, I thought I'd just read well sort of briefly read that um, line I moved from the human time skill of my family story through green and unfurling dendrological time to that which far exceeds the scope of my understanding, the deep and fathomless span of geological time, which I think is a great line um, and sort of shows how despite, you know, um, these different lifespans being distanced from each other, there is a, an intersection between them. And I'm wondering if you could talk a bit more about interconnectedness and how you feel writing about the environment reveals or challenges uh, human interconnectedness. Yeah. yeah, I think, you know, it was one of those things that I, I almost had to tease out of the narrative a lot more to make this work as a story, but also to make it feel true to my own experience was this sort of sense of, of interconnectedness. And I guess of scale is the best way to put it, because when I first sat down to write this book, I wrote a draft that was literally just like point A to point B, this is in order the events as they happened. And it was so flat and it was so boring. Um, it was really, really, really dreadful. First drafts are often like that. Um, and the thing I realized at a certain point was that the story I wanted to tell about my family and um, their sort of entanglement with the sort of political world with, with with history, with cultural history, with um, migration in Taiwan, as well as environment and place, that was the sort of one circle on a spiral, I guess, of a much wider story. So there was sort of my own journeys through Taiwan and my family's story sort of floating in time. And then this much wider sort of territorial history of Taiwan. And of course, then the sort of like big geological history that that is in the background of everything that we do. And and for me, it was only once I realized that those things were almost like, if you imagine them like on a slinky that you would pull apart, like they were like linked, right? And my story was one scale down here, and my my family story was another scale, and that like you could like every moment in the book should scale up to mirror all of those other scales. Um, once I realized that the book had to function that way because that is how the world works, um, it it felt a lot smoother to me. But yeah, it was it was a challenge to write um, because I it meant like constantly calling attention to like even in the smallest moments, interrogating how how they would be implicated in like much wider political, colonial, um, environmental forces. I think it just sort of became this preoccupation in the back of my mind. So um, I, hope that, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, it really does. Um, I've got some questions for the both of you. Um, so whichever one of you wants to answer first, but um, just about nature writing, I'm, I'm curious whether you would both identify with the term nature writer. Do you both call yourself that? And um, yeah, what do you think that means to be a nature writer? Alice, do you want to take it? Or? <laughs> I am happy to kick it off. I think that um, nature writing is a broad church and I am so glad it is only getting broader. Things like the Willow Herb Review have done incredible uh, work to broaden what, who is uh, visible and present in nature writing and the Nan Shepherd Prize would be another um, initiative that I would kind of raise as broadening that church even further. Um, I sit in a funny little corner of nature writing. Um, I am, a, you know, I sort of work in the environmental humanities, but I come at things uh, aslant. So the project I'm currently writing or uh, working on is about rot. Um, so again, it is nature, but it's nature very much embedded in other cultural um, ideas. I'm interested in how we consume ideas images, thoughts, theories about nature and tie them to our um, governing beliefs in the world, essentially. Um, so I feel as if I am a nature writer, but I also still feel, I mean, I am from an enormous background of privilege, but I'm also queer and disabled. And I look around and see who nature writers are, who they're allowed to be, who gets a table in Waterstones, who gets a BBC uh, show, who gets a prize. 
um, and looking at shortlists and long lists and seeing who's who's at that table, it's still woefully undiverse. There is still a massive emphasis on white male walking literature, I would have said. And those other voices have to work very, very, very hard to have a seat at that table. And that's something um, that I think cannot be allowed to remain and feel quite passionately um, should not be should not be the case. Uh, but I'm also aware that in terms of um, the commercial world and sales, uh, that is still something that is very prevalent and changing the structures around publishing and who is seen and who is allowed to speak about nature is the, the key to kind of unlocking um, a much broader and richer view of the world brought about by many more voices. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that so strongly, Alice. I feel like you've, you've sort of hit the nail on the head there in, in all sorts of ways. Um, I feel like it's one of those terms like that, depending on the context, I find useful. And I think, you know, particularly as someone who um, writing within like a UK nature writing landscape, but never really writing about the UK, like my first book was about Germany and this book is about Taiwan and like really sort of in some sense, really not wanting them to be positioned as travel literature, which is really important to me because I don't like that gaze. Um, there is like, it. I, I almost find nature writing helpful for me as a label in order to sort of interject with the idea that like, we can have a nature writing that isn't about a, a man going for a walk in the north of England. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we can have a nature writing that imagines something different, that looks at, 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 other, at other lands without othering them, that where you know we're automatically by by asking questions about land asking questions about migration and borders and what those mean so for me it's sort of it's it's a useful term when it's useful <laughs> it has power thank you um maybe you could talk to us about how you got started writing about nature um maybe uh, alice we could start with you yes of course so um i didn't really um I am a kind of poet by experience and upbringing um, and write a lot about nature and poetry because, I mean, it's all around us. It, it, you know, pathetic fallacy is, is, um, is real. Uh, but it wasn't until I started um, undertaking my doctoral research that I really started working in the environmental humanities. Before that, I was a medievalist and I worked in the uh, history of uh, effective piety so um religious visions in the medieval period is my kind of historic area and so although I'd always been interested in nature it had been a very informal relationship until the beginning of my doctoral training so I am um I am drawing on a lifetime of noticing but I had never conceived of myself as somebody who was more or less interested in nature than anyone else but it turns out that I am more interested than some people and maybe maybe less interested in some aspects than others I always feel very shamed by the um not a very good Collins bird book person like I can't tell things by their call always or like I see a mushroom I know about three kinds of mushrooms that I'd feel confident picking and the rest I'm like oh no no thank you so um that's kind of a complicated answer but I hope I hope that's an honest one I so deeply identify with that. <laughs> I'm really bad with birds. And I feel like that's like become the thing that is like all nature writers must be good with birds. And I'm really bad with birds. Um, there are a few birds in this book. And I feel like a lot of it is about me like misidentifying birds and being really bad at birds. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like I got into it in a similar way in in some sense. Like I, I trained from an undergraduate level really looking at, at environment and nature and place um, in the humanities. And then I went on to do a doctorate in the environmental humanities focusing on environmental history. But I think getting into nature writing itself was like perhaps partly a response to sort of having all of that brought to me in a very academic environment, in a very research-based environment where it was always sort of premised as argument, as as this sort of very, I guess, rigid structure of like the kind of thing I had to be writing. So I started doing a little bit of nature writing, I think, as a little bit of a rebellion during my doctorate. Um, 
And that was so, you know, I ended up with these huge passages in my doctorate that were ostensibly nature writing. And then I was like, oh, I should probably go do this over here <laughs> um, if I'm going to actually write this PhD. And so that, that was my way in, in the end. Um, thinking about um, climate change, you've sort of touched on it, Alice. Um, do you feel a sense of responsibility when you're writing to address it? Because it's so, such a big issue now. Do you feel that you have to address it when you when you write about nature? I think not to address it is very um, difficult because it's so apparent. I also think that um, my responsibility is to noticing. So there is a very long history uh, of occult or witchcraft involvement in the environmental movement. Um, and it's something that I'm working on academically at the moment. And so those two things go very well together because they both have a sense of personal responsibility and stewardship for the planet at their heart. But I'm also extremely aware of the troubled nature of caring for the planet as an idea that positions us at the top of a pyramid of hierarchy and the, the poor world, the poor defenseless planet at the bottom. So I hope that reading my book is like, is like looking. And I hope that that looking brings people pleasure. And I hope that that engagement makes people care more and do whatever it is that they feel able to do. So it is a very, very small um, contribution to a very, very large problem. But I feel that that is the only bit that's in my gift. Yeah, I think I think this idea of noticing is really key here because it's there's that sort of noticing that helps others see, right? Like, um, and to, to find those same mirrors in their own lives. And, you know, to go back to what I was saying earlier about this, this idea of like sense of scale, for me, there's not really any way of writing without climate change, without, um, uh, you know, without, I guess, the sort of legacies of empire. There, there are so many sort of things that you can't, you can't really avoid writing about. You just write, write about them at different scales. And so for me, being able to like, tell those stories at sometimes very small scales that might seem like, oh, we're just focusing on one particular tree. How is that helpful to us? Like that actually I think is very powerful because those are the stories people remember that they hold on to, and then they're, they're able to make those connections between that one single tree and a much wider sort of global force. And I, I think that's a really important exercise of, of noticing, of telling stories, of sort of creating those moments that hook onto people that, that they're then able to carry forward. So they have this sort of connection between really, really small things in daily life and big things that seem overwhelming like climate change. Great, thank you. Um, just to make everyone, just remind everyone, we are gonna be opening up for audience Q&A soon. So if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, I wonder if you have any questions for each other. Um, yeah. You're free to ask them. Um, I have a question for you, Alice. Is it okay if I if I ask you? I've been I was thinking about it ever since I um, started reading the book, and I'm really excited. I, um, yeah, I really love it. And now I, it's I want to like keep it by my bedside so that when I come to every month, I can read um, <laughs> read read with the seasons. Um, one of the things I was really thinking about was this idea you put forward of sort of engaging with with nature and sort of the practice of witchcraft as this like this practice of, of I guess transforming the world and transforming nature and I'm really curious to like think a little bit about foraging and the ways in which you sort of engage with nature and I don't know if this is like a very clearly formed question but I I was really curious about how foraging for you and sort of this act of collecting nature is transformative for you. So I think for me it's a very it's I um I have a condition that means I sometimes can't walk very far. Um, it's a pain related condition and I'm a very tactile person. I understand the world through my hands and my mouth and um, always want to put my mouth on trees. And I know it's not a very like great thing to do. Um, and for me, bringing things back is a way of connecting to the world when I can't be in it or I can't be in it in the ways that I would like to be. Um, you know, I was brought up climbing Monroe's. I, you know, did my Duke of Edinburgh. I uh, used to be a very kind of straightforwardly outdoorsy person and that has become more complicated. And so these physical mementos of the world are very important, but I also think it's important that I say here 
uh, that the ethics of foraging are very important. It's had a huge increase in popularity in the last few years from being a kind of 1970s hippie, like we don't need to do that, we can buy our food in a supermarket kind of 80s attitude. It's become much more mainstream again, especially during COVID because it's an activity on your doorstep. So I always try and take only what I need and leave enough for other people and enough for wildlife. And that's a very important um, kind of practice around the ethics of it. But I think for me, uh, there is a theory from the witch practitioner, Sabrina Scott, um, his name I'm just gonna put in the chat so that uh, it's easy for everyone to see, who uh, takes from object-oriented ontology, which I suppose I follow fundamentally, the idea that we can draw all, um, objects into relation with ourselves and that they all hold energy or power or presence or selfhood or some aspect of intelligence and that by engaging with them we kind of network out into the world and what that means on a very physical body level is that I take a great deal of pleasure from touching and collecting things but I also think it's a way of telling myself into the world and letting the world come into where I am um, and I have a question, I have a question for you, uh, which is, I am really, really struck in your book by the way that you use language, um, multiple languages. It's, it's a kind of uh, a book with polyphony. And I wanted to ask what the process of writing that and having it published was like, and what, what that process was like, were people very supportive of it? Was it um, something that you had to argue for? I'm very curious. Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those interesting questions that I feel like is actually really changing across publishing at the moment um, for, for a lot of writers, um, especially diaspora writers who I think, you know, very naturally gravitate to writing with multiple languages. Um, I, like, there was no way for me to tell the story without the inclusion of a lot of other languages because so much of the story is set in, in Taiwan and for me at least took place in speaking Mandarin um but I also feel like it was really important for me to layer questions of language and meaning and I guess the sort of supremacy of certain languages in certain places into the story because Taiwan is a place that has been repeatedly colonized and so like it's a place where language is layered in the same way that like political history is layered like everything everything there is is sort of shaped by these ma many like like layers of languages ex like imposed on on people and land um so that was important for me but it was also like how do I put it it's kind of just how my brain works now and I think this is what happens like when you're raised multilingual and then have lived all over the world which I've been very privileged to do um and I wrote this book while I was still living in Germany. <laughs> and so, so much of like, even when I was writing this book on, on those days, it would be like, I would be writing in English and in Chinese and then turn around and order my coffee in German. And <laughs> like every day I would be sort of confronted by this fluidity that I had to have. Um, and so I really wanted that to exist in the book. Um, and one of the things I was quite fierce about was that like occasionally certain things wouldn't be translated and that that was important for me or that they would be translated in very subtle ways because I, I also didn't want to make, I think there is that tendency that we, we very often will like assume that the reader of this memoir or this nature book is a white English speaking audience. Um, and I, I really didn't want this book. Like I wrote this book basically with like a young woman like me in mind, which would mean that they should be able to confront this book and read read it very fluently. Um, and I didn't want it to be like like an othering experience for them. So that was really important for me to sort of like have that opportunity to occasionally not translate a word and for that to be enough because it's like, you know what, we like like non-English, non-native English speakers and many other <laughs> readers in the world have been like, we've been doing it for ages, right? Like playing that kind of catch up and it's fun to sort of turn the tables a little. Um, one of the big things that I pushed for was non, um, non-italicizing, non-non-italicization, I guess, of um, non-English words. So um, the only words that are italicized in the books in the book are um, like Latin names of plants, which is that's yeah. like that's an academic habit of mine where I'm like I, I can't break this habit, but the rest of them will not be italicized um, because I wanted I really wanted that fluidity of this idea of like when I sp switch into speaking German, when I switch into speaking Mandarin, I'm not suddenly speaking a foreign language. I'm 
still me speaking and that language is just as sort of comfortable to me as, as English was. And so not having italics on the page is a real way of sort of signaling that sort of fluidity. Um, so that was one of the things that's like, I had to, I had to sort of state that really clearly. And um, I know there's a really strong movement like across publishing and among many writers now to have that become the norm. It's so helpful because it means that when you're looking down a page before you read it, your eyes don't get hooked immediately on the foreign language words. Exactly, like the otherness of this like exoticized thing in the text, right? Like it's, like it's really funny to think about how something so small as punctuation and choice of typeface can, it can re sort of inscribe those acts of othering on the page. And so I really wanted to create a book that I don't know, somehow reflected my own experience much more coherently. Yeah, it's really, I think you've done it really beautifully. And I love as well the um, way that some of the first lines of the chapters are, are shaped so that we fall into them. Ah, yes, yeah, in, in this edition, it's really nice that I, that was one of the nice design things the publishers came to me with that I just, I thought was such a, a sort of um, whimsical, whimsical approach to it, which was really, yeah, it's quite, quite dreamy. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> um, Hannah, do we have to move to audience questions or are we? Have yeah, there's a question here from Fiona uh, for Alice. Um, she says, I love in your book how you talk about finding the nature in urban settings, even for people who don't have a lot of time or money or ability to get out into nature. Do you feel that nature writing is something people can do even when they are maybe disabled or restricted in their ability to explore? Sort of touched on this before, but maybe you'd like to answer some more? That's a lovely question, and one that I'm sure Jessica have a, a, an opinion about as well. But um, I think it's absolutely the case. I think that we, if we accept the fact that we are not different from nature, that we are part of the natural world, and that all things are part of the natural world, however unnatural they seem, plastic is part of the natural world, um, you know, micro pollutants and oil slicks are in, in and of and are nature, um, then it, we don't need to go in search of scale. And I think scale is the great trick of nature writing. We have not moved on sufficiently from the 18th century sublime. We still want somebody to go up a mountain and tell us how it feels. And we don't need, you know, there are other ways. I would love to read a really beautiful book about woodlice or about all of the things that somebody sees from their nursing home window over the course of a single winter. Um, I'm gonna type in the chat, so there's a really lovely um, book by Josie George, um, and it's called A Still Life. And Josie is a chronically ill writer who is largely confined to the home. And her book, although it's not specifically nature writing, is one of the most expansive, joyful celebrations of the natural world and the seasons that I've ever read. Uh, even though it is in its scope, absolutely minute. That's great, thank you. Um, just to remind you that um, you've actually sent those messages to us. So if you could just type them to everyone, if you just change it on the blue button, thank you. Um, Jessica, do you want to touch on maybe um, people being restricted in their, feeling, their ability to nature write? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, for me, this is one of those things that it requires a reimagining of, of who a nature writer is, as we've talked about already. But I also think like um, being able to sort of really interrogate this, this uh, obsession we have with an adventure narrative. I feel like, you know, as Alice mentioned, this idea of like going up a mountain and I go up a lot of mountains in this book. I am never successful. And that's really important for me. It's like, I'm never successful in getting that like view from the peak where I can like see the land laid out before me like a map. That's a that's a Robert McFarlane quote. Um, but where I can, you know, where I have that 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 experience of like, oh, this was I was seeking this sublime experience and I go up and I have it. Um, I feel like being able to interrogate and reimagine that that like impulse, I think is a really important thing because actually looking closely, looking with duration, looking with that sort of openness is I feel like it's a much more productive 
kind of exercise at this moment in time. Um, and that's sort of like to go back to this, like we can tell really, really small stories that shoot us in so many ways into something so much bigger where this like tiny story can be a portal into you know the much wider wider world and i think this is where urban nature becomes really important because um you know for me i i've basically always lived in like big capital cities and until recently i just moved and like for me so much of my daily experience of of the natural world has been like the little bit of moss that grows on my windowsill <laughs> it's like i it's it's not you know, vast unfolding fields. It's not mountains on my doorstep. Um, and being able to sort of have that act of noticing and caretaking and tending and and sort of honoring like that little bit of the natural world that exists alongside us um, is really, really, really vital, I think. Uh, and and it, it opens up, I guess, the, the the range of people who can actually have that opportunity. And I think this is this discussion is really important considering the pandemic we've just we're in right now with everyone's restricted to what to what they can see. And maybe you could talk about how the pandemic's affected um your approach to nature writing. Yeah. Um at least in my case, I so I I moved in the middle of the pandemic, which was a very strange thing. I like moved internationally and that was <laughs> quite stressful. Um and ended up sort of having to resettle and and re-experience sort of lockdowns in different countries in different formats and um one of the things that i found really transformative was i i took on a writing project with um another writer rowan hisayo buchanan who's also an illustrator and she and i took on this like small commission to write like a seed four seasons like guide to to the natural world and it was amazing to me because i had not until then like all of the things I had written were they're like big it's like me swimming in lakes for a whole year or me going to Taiwan and there were always these sort of like big narratives and being asked to just look and the, the project was called looking large and small and it was just like we would go and walk our dogs because that was like the one social engagement we were allowed and just notice nature and and having that opportunity to sort of really readjust my focus I found it really really transformative for me um but I'm also conscious of the fact that like, I think for so many people, what the pandemic brought about was, was not this sort of huge transformation in terms of like being able to feel more at home where they were, but actually feeling like, oh, like I suddenly feel like a lot of things are, are like, um, how do I put it? Like less accessible in the real world and more, more accessible. I feel like like those questions really changed for a lot of people in different ways. Um, Alice, how did you find it? Yeah, so I, had a sort of similar experience in that I was able to, so I live in the centre of Edinburgh and I got to know my local green spaces incredibly well and feel very kindly towards them. Um, but I also felt very hungry, still feel very hungry for novelty again. Um, and I'm not a driver. And unfortunately, one of the things that the pandemic has brought home to me, despite not being a driver for ecological reasons, is that I think I am going to have to learn to drive because that sense of being trapped. Um, I'm a clinically vulnerable person, so I was shielding for some time. And that idea of being trapped was so real. Uh, one of the things I, I did do, um, although it was earlier this year, so kind of coming out of the pandemic a bit was get a dog. Um, me and 8,000 million other people um, and he is the the love of my life he's a seven month old working cocker spaniel and I adore him and we go out and I actually feel weirdly that because he's so young he's made my nature noticing much worse because I spend my whole time trying to stop him eating tissues or um, you know steal footballs from small children or um you know, he tried to climb underneath a deer hound the other day. Um, so it's it's much more fun, but it's it's uh, a very different way of being in the world. Um, but I think the pandemic for me mostly was a case of caring very much about the very, 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 very small things. It was a case of, I had a snail as a pet for two weeks because it was injured and I let it, I brought it in for its shell to heal, which it did, and then I re-released it. And I used to sit and listen and hear him eating lettuce. And I used to think, my God, Alice, your life has got very sad. 
No, <laughs> but he was great. And I have to read the um, a wild the a wild snail eating the sounds of a wild snail eating because I feel like that was my pandemic. The sounds of a wild snail eating. Brilliant, thank you. I've just noticed it's half three, which sadly means this event's coming to an end. So I'd just like to say thank you so much, Alice and Jessica, for taking your time to talk to us about yourselves and your work and to everyone who's come here to join us today. Um, Alice and Jessica's books are available to purchase at Blackwell's University Bookshop, which you can visit via our website, um, waywardfestival.com. Um, additional thanks go to Explorathon for co collaborating with us, the media services team, the events team, the Wayward Festival folk for making this possible. And thank you, of course, to Leslie, our wonderful BSL interpreter, and Louise, our wonderful live captioner, as well as Creative Scotland and the University of Aberdeen for funding this event. Um, don't forget about the rest of the festival. Tomorrow is the last day. And if you'd like more on nature writing, we have Zakia McKenzie running a workshop at half 11. Um, if you'd like to book, the, book that, make sure to go on our website and follow us on all social media at waywardabdn. Thank you again, Alice and Jessica. Thanks for having us.